Hey everybody, this is Evan Brand back with the Not Just Paleo podcast. Thanks for tuning in. Before we go into today's episode with Dave Asprey, I wanted to give you a little bit more info on him so you know what to look for and what to listen for. Dave is most notable for what's called Bulletproof Coffee. And Bulletproof Coffee is a very high-grade coffee that's free from mycotoxins. Don't worry, we'll go into what mycotoxins are in this episode. And basically, you take a high-grade coffee, you put about one tablespoon to two tablespoons of grass-fed butter, such as Kerrygold, use an unsalted butter, and you put that butter in there along with some MCT oil. What is MCT oil? It's an extract of coconut oil. It stands for medium-chain triglycerides, and it's a very healthy source of fat that you want to get in the morning. So you take these three ingredients, you blend them all together, and you have bulletproof coffee. This is something that has improved a lot of people's lives because of the focus that you can get from it. So basically, you're supplementing your body with a huge amount of fat and healthy fat at that right in the morning. So this is going to curb appetite. You're going to have less crashes, a lot more sustained energy throughout the day. So you definitely want to tune into this and just check out what Dave has to say about Bulletproof Coffee. It's an awesome product, and you can make it yourself at home. So that's even better. So Dave Asprey is a Silicon Valley guy that's basically got into health and fitness, and he loves to experiment, and he loves to teach people about all the different research things that are going on with him and all of his findings. So I was so glad to have Dave on the show, and we'll definitely have him on again in the future because we tried to squeeze everything into an hour, and it just doesn't work. So maybe we'll start doing two-hour episodes. I'd love to do more episodes that are longer. But you could send me an email at evan at notjustpaleo and let me know what you think. And also go leave a review on iTunes also. That would definitely help this movement spread and hopefully we can get to more people and start changing lives and improving health. So if you've made it this far to the podcast, then you should pat yourself on the back because that means you're taking initiative to change and improve your life. So thank you so much for doing that and you're definitely a part of the healthy future. So we'll go ahead and get into this episode and thanks again to Dave and you can go check him out at bulletproofexec.com and of course you can find me back at notjustpaleo.com. Once again, man, it's it's so cool. I talked to Jimmy Moore and I talked to Abel and both times I was thinking of you. I'm like, man, I got to get Dave on this because you, you've you opened my mind to a lot of stuff. I heard you first on the Joe Rogan podcast, so that was how I actually found out about you. At the same time, I'm starting a fitness and nutrition website, and then I find you, so I guess it was meant to be. Oh, very cool. Well, I'm happy to help out. You know, We need more people just talking about how things work. You know, At a certain point, it's going to be kind of hard. You're going to go to like one of the bazillion paleo websites, and they're all going to say the same thing, but hey, maybe people will believe it, so that's good. Yeah, man. I work out at a 4,000-acre park in the daytime. So I'm, oh, wow. That's a pretty cool outdoor job, though. That's, oh, yeah. It's great. Right, nice. It's great. I think that I don't need a vitamin D supplement. Um, it depends. Are you working uh, on naked or anything? Or? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. I mean, do you really have to, or does UV well, rays get absorbed it, through certain layers? Maybe like a toga would work. No. It. It's true that uh, that you know if you're not exposing your skin to the sun, you're getting less vitamin D. I would go without a shirt as much as is reasonable, given the mosquitoes and all the other crap you got to deal with. But yeah, um, you know, it, it's always a trade-off. You're not going to get much through it, a t-shirt, even the SPF 30 t-shirts, you know, yeah. which allegedly lets them through. That's mostly marketing, and it doesn't like. <laughs> it's hard to get burned through any t-shirt. Yeah, yeah, that's true, man. Yeah, if I was, it's like a, it's pretty much the richest area of Louisville is where this park is. It's considered the East End, so I don't know what it would be considered for where you live, but basically you got Mercedes Benz driving through all day and they don't get out of the car. They just like to drive through and see a pretty park. So it's a uh, it's crazy, man. It's a weird environment, but it's de- it's definitely a blast. Um I could see the benefits of that. I mean, I I live in a basically an equivalently redneck part of the world um, by design. I've got, you know, old growth forest all around me. Not a bad life. No, it's beautiful. Yeah, like within like six feet of where I'm sitting, maybe ten feet, I think there's six or eight cedar trees that are at least like three foot across. That's so incredible. I'm, yeah. So what, those are probably hundred years at least. I'm guessing. I'm not sure how fast they really grow, but they're they're big old trees. Yeah. 
we have we have a area in our park. That's something I've learned a lot is I can judge a, the age of cedars just by looking at them. So if it's that big, man, it could be it could be two hundred years old. It, it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, this whole island is like you know uh, loggers love it up here because it, it just grows trees. It has for a long time. Yeah, uh, and uh, I mean, there's no shortage of them here. We'll put it that way. That's crazy. Have you ever been to the sequoias? Oh, yeah. I used to live in the Bay Area. I've been to the Methuselah tree, which is, I think, the oldest tree in North America, like 1,600 years old. Wow. You can't even see the top of that thing. It's amazing. That's crazy. Yeah, I heard they won't release the real oldest tree because they don't want people going there, so they tell you that that that's the (laughs) oldest. (laughs) It's like the decoy oldest tree. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, it's like this is the oldest one we'll tell you about. Hopefully you know Mammoth Cave, man. It's huge. About two hours from where I live is one of the biggest entrances of Mammoth Cave and they have a pit in there and they call it the bottomless pit. I don't know if they've ever actually identified the depth of it. I'm sure they have, but they have lights going as far as you can see and there's no end to it. it I mean, it looks like you're looking into the center of the earth. It's it's amazing. That's awesome. All right, well hey everybody, this is Evan Brand back with the Not Just Paleo podcast. This is an awesome day for all of us here, so we have Dave Asprey. Dave is into all different kinds of hacking of our sleep schedules, focusing uh, on a better diet, getting us lean. He's he's changing people's lives, and he's blown up over the past year, and very fortunate to have him on the show, so thanks, Dave. You know, you're welcome, Evan. I'm super glad to be here. So I guess that we should start from square one and tell us how you transferred – into the health and fitness world. I, I don't know that I could say I transferred versus I, I kind of got <clears throat> I got pulled here by by desire and by life. When I was in my my early twenties, I, I hit three hundred pounds and I grew up with chronic just chronic health problems. I was also a really high performance entrepreneur, but I've I'd had three knee surgeries by the time I was twenty three. I had arthritis in my knees when I was fourteen. Uh, obesity, uh, what they called pre-diabetes. In my late 20s, I had some blood work done. They came back and said, like, stroke or heart attack, pick a choice. Like, you've got extremely sticky blood. Like, you clot almost instantly. Like, you're in a very high-risk category, Uh, despite having, you know, made $6 million when I was 26. So I decided I was going to focus a little bit. And I spent, I actually talk about spending a quarter million dollars, but with some of the most recent stuff I've done, it's closer to $300,000 on personal biohacks. So 15 years of pretty hard work as well as a ridiculous amount of money invested, some of it on stuff that doesn't even work, but a lot of it on stuff that is shockingly, amazingly effective. Uh, I ended up at this thing where I'm, I'm into performance and it just so happens if you want to kick ass, health and wellness are part of the equation, but they're not the only part. In fact, you know, they're, I'd say they're a foundational part, but if you're just well, you don't attune to all the other things that make you bulletproof. You're you're just scratching the surface of what you are capable of doing. That's incredible, man. So you're actually the founder of what you call the bulletproof diet. So for all the paleo listeners, could you compare the two? Sure. Uh, the bulletproof diet's it's actually old. <laughs> um, I've been developing this thing for more than 10 years and very early versions of it I put online in 1998. I just didn't market it a lot. And, you know, the, one of the guys who really inspired me, not so much on the grass-fed side, but um, just more on the understanding some of the basic things, is a guy named Rob Fagan, who is not that well talked about anymore, but he was one of the earliest natural bodybuilders. And I'm not a bodybuilder. I'm an entrepreneur. Like, I, I want my brain to work really, really well, and I want my body to look good, and I don't want to spend a lot of time doing it, and I, I want to live for a very, very long time. So I'm like anti-aging and cognitive health, and it just so happens when your brain is kicking ass and you're going to live a long time, your body looks really good. Like that's a pretty nice combination. So the the basics of the Bulletproof Diet are not the same as the ones that the, the paleo diet people, who I consider to be you know, allies in the fight for food quality, but like I don't know what our ancestors ate for sure. We have some fossil records and endless, actually really interesting debates. You know, Lauren Cordain and uh, Rob Wolf and, and other guys like that who I, I think are inspirational and, and wonderful and, and just amazing guys. And Mark Sisson as well. I, I look at those debates and I'm like, you know what? The cavemen that I've met, mostly, you know, in high school football, 
Um, those guys didn't have access to mass spectrometers, centrifuges, chemistry labs, periodic tables, and they didn't have access to the internet. What we've done in the last 20 years with the internet is put an amazing amount of research online. It used to be if you wanted to do the Bulletproof Diet, it would take an entire lifetime of sitting in libraries using microfiche. I don't know, Evan, if you ever have used one of those no. evil inventions. No. It, they take photos of old books and, and you know articles that are now on PubMed, and they shrink them down to the size of a postage stamp. And you go to the library, and you check out this little envelope, and you take it out, and you put it in a reader. That's no. how I did research when I was like in seventh grade. And you can't get the volume of info into your head that you need. So the paleo diet you know, was invented by cavemen. Right. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't even have microfish, much less you know PubMed and and the web, as well as the accumulated science that we've completely unleashed on the world: genetics, epigenetics, proof that the environment changes genetic expression. So I looked into all that and really got serious when my wife and I decided to have kids. We had our second child when she was 42, and the first one she was 39, and she had polycystic ovary syndrome when she was 35. So they told her that she'd be you know, um, most likely unable to have kids. She's a Karolinska trained physician and no slouch, but you know, I, I really said, well, let's get you on this diet. That's helped me lose a hundred pounds and keep it off for a long time. And has rejuvenated my brain and, you know, changed all my biomarkers for the better. Uh, and we worked on that from a, just a human biology perspective and finally wrote it all down as part of creating the better baby book, which just launched on Amazon. You can go to betterbabybook.com or just Google better baby book you'll see how you apply this kind of thinking, this biohacking to pregnancy, to go beyond what cavemen could do. Because honestly, did cavemen have to decide whether one or two cups of green tea was optimal during pregnancy? No, they didn't have green tea. And if they did, they would have probably known, oh wait, they wouldn't have known because they didn't have big data and the ability to do epidemiology. But they also like might want to know that if you drink green tea, it inhibits your ability to use folic acid, so you're more likely to have neural tube defects in your children. So the way I look at it is like there's my my dear paleo friends, and then there's the biohackers. And at the end of the world, if there's only a little bit of space and food left, the biohackers are going to be coming for the paleo guys, but we're going to have like lasers. <laughs> and <laughs> and we'll, we'll be the ones who reproduce. That's crazy, man. <laughs> so you're still on board with Whole Foods and – grass-fed beef, tons of good fats and everything. So are there any key differences, though, as far as food? Oh, yeah. Yeah, th there are. Give us and a couple of them. Here's one thing. The food toxins are terribly, terribly important, and paleo pays attention to some but seems to ignore others. One of the biggest categories is toxins created by cooking. So The Upgraded Chef, which is my, my first cookbook, came out and that book is about how do you cook foods and the two most dangerous ones it turns out are fat and protein the stuff that you eat more of on paleo if you cook those things wrong you are seriously damaging the integrity of those foods and you can take something that is healthy which is a protein and you can damage it to the point that you create a whole actually several different classes of toxins and then at that point, you've now taken what would have been good for you and made it inflammatory, even if it was grass-fed, because you've got oxidized fats, and you've got heterocyclic amines, and you've got a bunch of damaged proteins that your liver has to work really hard to remove. So cooking quality matters, food quality matters, and then food storage matters. Um, within the paleo diet, you don't see as, you know, you see, oh, well, eat fresh. And like, well, okay, what does fresh really mean? And it turns out that mycotoxins are one of the largest contributors to chronic health problems that no one knows about. So if you want to look at the relationship between toxins from mold, this is environmental mold or mold in your food, and cardiovascular disease or cancer or even diabetes, there are amazing links out there. So when you're trying to get in that optimal mental performance state where your body doesn't just gain weight for no reason, where your brain just has limitless energy and focus, well – you've got to pay attention to these small amounts of toxins in your food. And it's not enough to say, eat cashews, which is maybe paleo, maybe not paleo. There are not, there's some debates there. Well, okay, if you're going to eat cashews, how were they stored? Where did they come from? Because it turns out if they were shelled and then stored in some moist warehouse for a while, you're probably going to feel brain fog after you eat them. And you'll think cashews cause brain fog, but that's not what's going on. What's going on there is that cashews that are mildly spoiled cause brain fog, but they don't taste bad. 
Wow. If you don't know that level of detail, then you're going to miss huge opportunities to just feel good and make things easy. So like I, like I said, I, I'm a huge fan of, of the paleo movement. You know, I, I go to the paleo conferences and I spend a lot of time with the guys. But other things, coffee. You want like to rock your day. Bulletproof coffee has gotten to be kind of famous. And this is a recipe that I invented, not from cavemen, but the closest living ancestors, maybe like old Tibetans. Uh, I went to Tibet. I drank yak butter tea. And I'm like, why am I at 18,000 feet and completely feeling so good? And why do these crazy Tibetan like nomad people carry, uh, you know, on their horses a full-on kit, either a, a, a blender and a generator to make yak butter tea, or an old-fashioned wooden churn, which is very heavy and bulky. And the reason that they do that to make their yak butter tea is because it does something magic. And it has to do with the way the fats are mixed with the tea. And when I created Bulletproof Coffee, I said, well, let's not be paleo about this. Let's use MCT oil. We didn't understand MCT oil until 1955. Before, if you were a coconut caveman because you lived in the tropics, you might have had some coconut and some fish and you might have done well like a few populations we've seen in the paleo studies. But what MCT oil does is it gives you six times the power of coconut oil on two specific functions. One of them is on thermogenesis and on fat burning. The other one is on cognitive performance. So it's not really likely that you're going to eat six tablespoons of coconut oil for breakfast, but one tablespoon of MCT oil gives you the MCT oils, at least two of the links that are most important of six tablespoons of coconut. Right. That's could, why. Could, yeah. Could you explain? Yeah. Could you explain how MCT oil is actually formed? Um, sure. So the. Well, there, there's several different processes. In fact, I have a whole blog post going up about this. When I decided to launch my own brand of MCT oil, it, it's it, the general logic goes like this. Coconut oil has MCT oil, so you should eat coconut oil. Well, vaguely true. And then you do a little more research and you say, oh, coconut oil has roughly 60% MCT oil in it. And you say, okay, so then I'm fine. And then all of a sudden you do a bit more research and you realize, oh, there's four lengths of medium chain triglycerides and two of them are the ones that have the magic powers. And coconut oil is only 15%, those two. So then you say, oh, I should go buy some MCT oil. You know, I'll pick a generic one. And you wouldn't imagine that there's like 20 different forms of MCT oil you can buy. Really? Uh, there are. Like I had to test all of them uh, as I was formulating my upgraded MCT product. And if people are listening to this say, Dave's selling his stuff, yeah, I'm selling my stuff. I have a bunch of researchers and people working to give away all this info for free. So if you like what I'm saying, buy my MCT oil, please. I am selling it, and it's not a bad thing. So compare that to Now Foods MCT oil. You know, I don't want to pick on any one vendor. I haven't done an assay of Now Foods, uh, and it, it's it's not a good business practice to basically stand up and like slam the crap out of your competition, right. unless it's unless it's Starbucks, then it's just I think ethically correct. Right. Look at the label. There's a different number of calories in Now MCT oil versus mine. There's different ingredients. They're different products, and the cost, uh, the wholesale cost for what they've got and what and what I've got are different. There's a difference in the density of the product. There's a difference in the taste of the product. And the bottom line is you can sell cheap MCT oil or you can sell stuff that's 100% pure. Most of the stuff out there, for instance, is 94 to 95% MCT, uh, the ones we want. And they didn't have a, a strong enough purification process to get to 100, which is where ours is. So it, it's one of those things like, you know, do you want butter or do you want grass-fed butter? And there's a difference. They both say butter on the label. And I, I mean, I would encourage people, you can try it and try it. They, they taste different. They look different. They have different stuff on the label. Um, one of them has glycerin. The other one doesn't. Um, are they from, you know, coconut? Are they not? Are they from palm? You can actually make it through some enzymatic processes. So there's there's a lot that goes into to doing one thing. And the idea that, you know, coconut oil is, is equal to MCT oil and that all MCT oils are the same isn't borne out once you start trying to formulate a product. It's it's actually amazingly challenging to find which grades, and you can easily pay five times more at the you know at the wholesale level to have a refiner do exactly the right thing to make the purest, like strongest MCT oil than you can to just basically bottle what's cheap and sell it at the low end. The low end stuff uh, it works, but it has other stuff in it that is not you know is not contributing to to the goal. Right. So. The standards for anything that I'm going to give my kids and that I'm going to eat myself are like I make it as, as well as I can, 
given existing manufacturing processes. It's the same with the coffee and the other things. Some of my stuff costs a little more, um, but I actually don't do two tier distribution. So the the stuff that you're you're seeing at the grocery store, like now or any other major brand like that, in order to sell something for let's say fourteen dollars at the grocery store, that means that the person who's creating the product has to have a product that they spent two dollars on. So there's a seven x markup between what you pay. This is, goes for the entire food manufacturing industry, by the way. So that means that that stuff you're going to the store and you know you're you're paying this money for it. Whoever made it really spent two dollars on it, and then whoever bought it from them spent four dollars on it, and whoever bought it from them spent eight dollars on it, and they sold it to the grocery store and sold it for fourteen dollars. That, that sort of thing, and, and the different products have different margins, but that's about the ratio. That's so, incredible. Yeah, but that's how much you're spending on the grocery distribution system. If you go direct, which is what I'm encouraging, you know, other other companies to do as well, you can make a much higher quality product. I actually run into problems where I have a guy who wants to sell bulletproof all throughout um, the Asia Pacific, and I'm like, all right, and, but he wants to buy it from me for less than it costs to make it. <laughs> I'm like, wow, yeah. Good luck with that, that. buddy. And he, he shows me a spreadsheet. He goes, well, I have to – these guys buy it for me for this. And then these guys buy it from them for that. And then these guys put it on the shelf and they need to make money. And I'm like, that's not my business. Like I'm going to take the money that I would have spent on multiple tier distribution and I'm going to put it into the best product I can do. And then there's exactly one level of markup, which basically pays for you know my team and the, the research we do and all that kind of stuff. Um, I don't even like draw a, a salary from the company. Like I have a day job. Like I'm just trying to, you know, reinvest it into the community. I sponsor some um, some mixed martial arts fighters. A guy named Jason Lambert, <clears throat> a guy named Jason Lambert, um, ex UFC heavyweight, and um, we sponsor a quantified self meetup and just like trying to trying to do the right thing and, and bring this knowledge out there. For almost a decade, I've been uh, um, helping to run the Silicon Valley Health Institute. Every month for 19 years, we've had guys like Aubrey de Grey. And uh, um, actually, we had Gary Tobbs come and speak for uh, for the local community in the, the Silicon Valley. And we put the videos online for free, uh, just like to try and get the word out here. Like, That's my goal awesome. is to help people. That's what it's all about. That's awesome, man. So what have you done to beat the grocery store's prices? I've heard you talk about using your deep freezer. What's your typical grocery purchase look like? And are you going to a local farm? or? Well, right now... Uh, we just took delivery of uh, four grass-fed sheep two miles from the house. I think I spent like four or five bucks a pound on those. Um, the other thing that's coming next week, because it's that time of year um, here where I live on uh, Vancouver Island, we have half a cow, grass-fed cow, um, butchered according to my specs. And I actually ordered this one not aged for mycotoxin reasons. It's amazing what fresh meat tastes like versus meat that's been hung for you know a couple weeks uh, in order to age it, it actually tastes better when you, eat, when you just have it frozen two days after it's butchered or two days after it's uh, slaughtered and right after it's butchered. So that's coming. That's three fifty a pound. So my meat is cheaper than like crab meat from a normal grocery store. Three fifty a pound is very affordable, and that includes a mix of ribeye and hamburger <laughs> and everything in between. Wow, that um, sounds veg- awesome. So is there a website where people can find? Uh, I mean, is there a you know, besides U.S. wellness meats and stuff like that, do you have any recommendations? Yeah, check out um, Bulletproof Exec. Uh, I have a whole series on grass-fed meat and why it's good for you, along with uh, recommendations for a couple places where you can get it. Um, my favorite guys uh, only have 300 head of cattle, uh, but I've got a link there, and it, that is some of the best beef uh, I've been able to find. And you know, U.S. Wellness has you know a, a really nice large operation; they keep growing and like. We need there to be demand for grass-fed meat and other grass-fed products because when there's enough demand, then there will be a supply. But if you know we allow mass, basically animal torturers uh, who do these you know commercial feedlot kind of operations, if we allow them to to dumb down the rules or allow them to prevent us from saying this beef is grass-fed or the things they're trying to do then there will be no demand and we'll have crap food. And at that point, you have to either kill your own animals or raise your own animals, and that's a lot of work. Yep. Well, that's awesome, man. So 
you just buy like a hundred pounds of beef at a time? No, no, half a cow is more like three or four hundred pounds, depending on the weight of the cow. Wow, that's awesome, man. So, could you give us your typical amount of butter and MCT oil that you're going to put in bulletproof coffee? Say, I'm just making an eight ounce serving of coffee. Um, okay, so let's start with making the coffee. So, I use obviously the upgraded coffee beans that don't have toxins. Um, I haven't really put the research up online yet, but we spent thousands of dollars certifying that the beans are, are as free of toxins as I've been saying they are for a long time because I designed the process for them. So toxin-free beans that don't contain things that affect cognitive performance negatively. Uh, two tablespoons of that, eight ounces of hot water, brew it using a metal filter. The metal filter matters because this is like a French press or a gold filter in your drip because paper filters soak up some of the anti-inflammatory compounds that are in coffee. Uh, the difference in how you feel is actually tangible. Like you get a little bit more kick out of coffee that's French pressed wow. than if it's just through paper. But if it's bad coffee, even if it's you know expensive coffee, but it's expensive coffee that's processed in a in a less optimal way, you will also pick up more of the other toxins that are in the coffee if you're using a metal filter. So you want clean beans, um, and then you can get you can go to Upgrade itself. We have the beans there. They're actually two dollars less than starbucks reserve they're not overpriced uh and they're extensively tested dave is any sort of say a a shade grown organically grown hawaii blend of coffee that you find is that still going to have some sort of mycotoxins and and what affects what i be feeling from mycotoxins if i have no idea anybody that drinks starbucks i guess is considered in this you know i can't say every cup of starbucks has mycotoxins in it i can simply say that one study I referenced on the website says 93% of coffee from South America – actually, was it 93.7 or 93? Anyway, 93.7, I think, <laughs> of, yeah. percent of coffee from South America has detectable mycotoxins in it. Um, usually, um, aflatoxin is a significant issue, but that one's controlled in some countries and, and in some crops. But the one that is particularly painful is, is called ochratoxin. It's not regulated in the U.S. It's a known problem. Another study says that the average coffee drinker gets 25% of the European safe maximum dose of ochratoxin from their coffee. We know it's in there. And by the way, if you work in the coffee industry and you're listening to this, right now you're probably swearing and saying that Dave Asprey guy is a charlatan. And you know what? I'm sorry. I didn't write any of this stuff. This comes out of coffee agricultural research and biochemistry. The reason I know all this stuff is because I had to give up coffee. One of my great loves for five years because my joints swelled up and I felt like crap and got a and got a headache every time I drank a cup of coffee. Starbucks included, but not just Starbucks. Like any coffee, even at a nice coffee shop, you know, with shade grown organic beans. And so I'd give up coffee, and then I'd break down and say, "I'm I'm gonna have just a cup," and I'd feel so good. And then two days later, I'd have a cup and I'd feel like crap again. And one day, as I became more of a biohacker, it just occurred to me that I'm not crazy. That what's going on here is that the cups of coffee are different. And I started really doing like the sleuthing work to understand what's going on here. And what happens is that a lot of coffee, especially if it's a blend, it's almost guaranteed to have mycotoxins. Think about like what we do with beef. You take meat from like a thousand animals and you know you mix it all up into a ground burger the chances of there being some E. coli in there are pretty good because one of those thousand cows might have had E. coli. We do, <clears throat> we do the same thing with coffee. We take coffee from – basically when you're buying it at the tens of millions of pounds level, it's just a commodity. It's shipped in you know, giant uh, container ships, uh, open hold sometimes, you know, a wash in diesel fumes. This is actually creating a lead problem in coffee right now if it's not packaged properly. You know, burlap bags are not um, – are not, adequate for healthy coffee, in, in, at least not in the bulletproof process. So you, you go through all these things, and if you have a 100 different or a 1,000 different producers of coffee all mixed together into your blend, the chances that some of them didn't process their coffee well or that the coffee was moldy and they let a few bad beans through, the chances are almost certain. So you're going to get some toxins in your coffee. You may say, oh, it doesn't matter, except it does. And the I'm not... I haven't put the data out yet, and uh, I'm just working on like the final reporting for it. But I can show the difference in cognitive performance between a mass market brand of coffee and upgraded coffee because coffee is full of amazing stuff that's good for you. More antioxidants than wine. Like It is an adaptogenic herb in my book. 
like like you know, might not in the book I wrote, but just in my way of thinking, it's it's an amazing performance enhancing adaptogenic herb. It fueled a lot of the enlightenment scientists. Like it, it is a part of humans cultural evolution. And then well, the problem is a lot of it has this mold in it, which is the opposite of good. So you end up drink coffee, feel good, crash. You get tired two hours after you drink your coffee. Maybe you get a little cranky and jittery or you get a little headache or a little buzz and you need another cup. That's because the coffee cycle when you drink toxic coffee is you drink it, you buzz, you crash. You drink it, you buzz, you crash. And you do it until you go to sleep. When you drink coffee that doesn't have toxins, you drink it and you buzz. You feel really good and focused but you never crash. You just land. You come back to feeling normal again and you come back to feeling normal hours later and you can take another cup or you can leave it. So you tend to drink less coffee when it has less toxins in it and you tend to feel much better and your quantifiable measures of executive function, six of the nine we measured actually go up. That's crazy. So you literally can feel the difference. So I guess it's a it's just the more gradual up and down. Is is there still the same amount of caffeine in yeah. these products? It's the same amount of caffeine. I don't I don't tinker with the coffee at all. What I'm doing is I'm removing um, what we'll call old and outdated and unsafe techniques of agriculture and processing of the coffee. People in the U.S. are trained so much to focus on the roast. You know, roasting really matters, like a lot, because it's a flavor issue. And if you over roast the beans, like some coffee companies are favorites, you know, the dark roast, you can actually damage some of the delicate oils in the coffee. But okay, roasting is important, but what do you put in the roaster? And here we have the, the famous blend. What a blend is actually is you buy some cheap coffee and you buy some expensive coffee and you mix them together so it tastes good enough. The cheap coffee usually has more defects. Coffee defects are highly correlated with mycotoxins. A coffee defect is a bean with a crack or a pit or a bug bite in it. And half the bugs that bite coffee have toxic mold spores on their feet. How do I know that? Because I found the research it's linked to on my site. So you've inoculated the cracked beans with toxins and then you let the beans spoil as part of the process of creating coffee. They call it fermenting or natural processed coffee. Or even washed coffee is held in a tank to ferment for 12 to, in some cases, like 70 plus hours. During that time, biogenic amines like histamine form. Histamine, you've heard of that, you know, antihistamines stop allergies. Well, so histamine is one reason coffee can make you feel like crap. And the other one is ochratoxin and fumonisin and aflatoxin and these other things that are not measured in coffee in a typical environment whatsoever. Those are the things that I measure for chemically. And then we measure the cognitive function of the coffee compared to a control coffee. It's different. That's the difference between paleo and upgraded coffee, by the way, or paleo and the bulletproof perspective. Yeah, that was great. So I was going to ask you, what about someone who doesn't drink coffee at all, but they still want to get the mental energy and that extra focus from not using caffeine or any sort of stimulant? What other supplements or vitamins could they try? There's a bit of a problem here. If you want to live without stimulants, I think you're going to have to stop eating. Because one effect of stimulants is raising cortisol, right? Well, every kind of food raises cortisol, which is a stimulating action. So, hmm, I guess you'd have to eat an all-fat diet because that raises cortisol the least of any kind of food. Carbohydrates raise it the most and protein raises it somewhere in the middle of the two. But like this, this notion of living stimulant-free, I'm sorry, what kind of lights do you have in your house? Is bright light stimulating? Oh, got to turn those off. So you want to live stimulation-free? Go live in a cave, naked, and don't eat anything. <laughs> but in terms of stimulants like rhodiola, adaptogenic herbs, and different things like that, what is your, your everyday go-to supplement or herb? Oh, so those ones are okay. <laughs> but caffeine, which is an herb, <laughs> it's coffee. It comes from a plant. That's somehow not okay. I don't understand the difference. Right. Yeah. I just don't drink coffee, so I'm just curious. Oh, this is to... a personal question. I got it. Yeah. So, and and why do you take rhodiola but not coffee? What's the rationale? Like, is there like a specific reason for that? I just haven't took the time to research a blend of coffee that I like. Okay. So, so basically, lack of lack of knowledge of coffee. Exactly. Uh, Okay, that, that's a fair point. So then if you don't want to drink it because you don't know about it, the easiest thing to do would be to know about it. But if you wanted some other stuff, I don't think you can actually get a few of the things that are in coffee very well in other places. Turmeric would be a place to start. That's another herb that I recommend. 
the thing about coffee is that there's two uh, diterpenes in it that affect inflammation in the brain pretty dramatically. So they turn off neurological inflammation. So one of the things that makes you get the cognitive edge that you get from coffee that you don't get from rhodiola is that you get the lack of inflammation in the brain, which allows your brain to work better, like the mental sharpness turns on. But that said, I'm a huge fan of rhodiola. I take that stuff. Um, ginseng is not a bad idea. Ginger is not a bad idea. Uh, I already mentioned turmeric. It turns out the form of turmeric matters quite a bit. The, uh, the common practice is to add something called bioperine to turmeric in order to increase it, your levels of turmeric in the blood. Bioperine is an extract of black, uh, black pepper, which unfortunately is a major source of aflatoxin itself. But here's the, here's the kicker. If something inhibits something in your liver in order to raise blood levels of something else, what are you inhibiting in the liver? <laughs> so my take on that is that that's a natural supplement industry trick that is in line with what the pharmaceutical companies do when they do a time release formula. And it's usually not a good idea. A cellulose based time release as you digest the cellulose is released. That's fine. But I don't think bioperine is a great idea. So in your turmeric supplement, you can look for standardized curcumin levels, but don't go for that bioperine thing. I, I am not convinced it's a good idea biologically. Is there a certain brand that you would recommend for that? Um, of turmeric? Yeah. Um, there's one called, uh, BPM95. I'm pretty sure that's the right name. Okay. Uh, just off the top of my head. The reason that one's interesting, they standardize the amount of the Voltol oils in their turmeric so that it's a whole turmeric product, but it's because of the way they standardize it, the blood levels of that one rise higher and stay higher than like five or ten times higher than normal turmeric. That's the stuff I take. So it's just a lot higher quality. Would you actually feel different on it? Uh, you know, if you have inflammation in cognitive inflammation, uh, you actually can feel different. You can have pain, like joint pain or something like that, go down as well. Uh, but you're not going to get like the really big, just focusing drive that caffeine gives you. Uh, you could try yerba mate or green tea. You can get some nice effects there. Um, but coffee, because of the combination of these anti-inflammatories in the brain, the antioxidants, and all the other like anti-cancer things that, that coffee does. Um, by the way, I'm not making health claims for my coffee. I'm just saying there are studies out there that show that coffee can inhibit brain cancer and, and prostate cancer in a substantial amount of the time. Um, but from that perspective, that's uh, like those are the reasons that I do turmeric and coffee, and I consider it part of my supplement regimen and an enjoyable part of my day. But it's an herbal supplement the way I'm using it. Oh, that's awesome. Something I wanted to go into in your daily your daily routine is the amount of salt that you take in. I talked to Wendy Myers on a couple episodes back, and we were talking about how popular the Himalayan salt is getting, and why is salt quality important? Well, I, I gave a, a, a I think I have it on the site about three years ago. I gave this this big lecture about salt and went through the history of the salt scam. And I think this is around the same time that Gary Tobbs came out with one of his pieces about salt. It, it might have been right before that. Um, but I, I think Gary's piece, if, if you're interested in the salt thing, definitely look at uh, Gary Tobbs, T-A-U-B-E-S, and salt, and you'll find uh, all kinds of cool info. But the quality of salt matters because of what's in our oceans. Our oceans are full of crap right now, plastic crap that – probably will end up choking off one of the basic parts of our food supply, like just scraps of, of very small pieces of plastic that don't biodegrade, that are killing fish and algae and things like that. But aside from that, these, this amazing amount of high mercury coal that the U.S. burns, and to some extent China now, um, that makes for mercury that goes up into the air and ends up in the oceans, like millions of tons of it. So you're getting pesticides and mercury and other toxic metals in seawater, you dry up the seawater and, well, you end up still having these in your salt. So the preferred way to get the most important minerals from salt is to find an ocean that dried up a long time ago before we managed to pollute it. And the most famous and best source of that comes in the Himalayas, where there's this pink salt that they mine. So there's increasing worldwide demand for that. I've seen no 
research about how big the mines are, but apparently it's in a dried up seabed, so it's very large. But there will be some point in my lifetime where we probably exhaust the supply of Himalayan salt and have to deal with that. But in the meantime, salt quality matters because there's no crap in that stuff. There's also trace minerals, stuff you're not going to get in normal processed salt. In fact, processed salt usually has aluminum and other flowing agents and chemicals. And the effect on your body of taking chemically pure uh, straight sodium and then adding some flowing agents to it and taking it is different than having a mix of sodium with some trace minerals in the body. They're just a different product. Just like grass-fed meat is not red meat. It is grass-fed red meat and it has different physiological properties. The generic coffee on the shelf is not the same as mycotoxin-free coffee. They both say coffee. They're not the same. And salt, you know, at the local uh, Denny's or something in the salt shaker is not the same salt that you get if you go for the Himalayan salt. In fact, um, I have I just uh, did a deal with Joe Rogan's um, uh, Joe Rogan's company on it, and um, they just launched a new Himalayan salt product that's really good. I've got links to it on my site. If you use those links, I appreciate it because I get a small a small commission there, which helps to cover the cost of running the Bulletproof site. Um, if not, you can just go to their site directly. Um, you can either go to Bulletproof Exec and look for salt, or you can go to on it and look for salt. And uh, um, what you'll find there is that the salt tastes sweet. And I've done this countless times with my skeptical friends, you know, my, my Wharton MBA friends who think I'm, or at least used to think I'm kind of a nut until they saw all the changes. And uh, I'm like, here, let's go to your kitchen. Like, take out your salt, put it on your finger and taste it. And like, well, it's not that good. I'm like, Great. Now take the pink salt, try it. When you do that, they're like, oh, it's sweet. It's good. And they always switch. And you come back and you find that they put their old box of, you know, morons salt and they uh, they put it under the sink as a cleaning agent. And they went and they bought the expensive salt because you know, salt matters. That's why you ask if a man is worth his salt. That's why the Romans paid their soldiers in salt because you die without it. And humans don't reserve salt very well compared to, say, potassium. So it's a critical thing and you got to get it every day. Take it every morning in water you will find a massive difference in your daily performance because you unloaded your adrenal glands. So the average person still thinks that salt is negative upon your blood pressure. Can you tell us why is it that it's okay to have this much salt? And what, what are you taking a day? About a gram of salt a day? Uh, no, more like eight grams of salt a day. I think the, the RDA is, they keep trying to lower it, but it's like two grams. I mean, we'll just walk through the salt idea a little bit. Another famous quote on salt, this, this is one that I just love, um, from the Bible, actually. Can that which is unsavory be eaten without salt, or is there any taste in the white of an egg? Okay, This is the Bible being paleo. Wow. <laughs> That's uh, Job 6.6. 6. <laughs> wow. Uh, anyhow, let, let's, let's talk a little bit more about <clears throat> people believe salt increases hypertension, stroke, heart attack that you need to reduce your sodium intake. Here's why it happened. 1949, this guy named Bill Schwartz, a researcher. But let's go back to salt. Yeah, sure, man. Um, That whole being a biohacker extends to your computer because I do work in Silicon Valley technology. So 1949, this guy named Bill Schwartz, a medical researcher, found out that three people who were already had edema and congestive heart failure they improved when he gave them some toxic drugs called sulfonamides. And he started this way of thinking like, hmm, what would happen if you did these, these diuretics? Some other people said, hmm, if you have kidney disease and heart failure, low salt helps. And they had this crazy diet for people with malignant hypertension in their kidney disease. And they could eat only rice and fruit and no starch and they lived. So th- there were some very extreme cases where it made sense. And then around the same time, they bred salt-sensitive, high high hypertension rats. And what that did is that gave them a model so they could start focusing on this, on salt, as you know, it's all about the salt. This came right out of the drug industry. And we fast forward from there. And in 1979, without a lot of research, the Surgeon General made this report that said, Salt is a clear cause of high blood pressure, period. Based on some rat studies and some stuff that had happened in the previous 25 years, 
but none of it very conclusive. And since 1979, the U.S. government has been actively trying to prove that salt causes high blood pressure, and it just isn't that simple. And, and once the government makes a mistake on that level, it's very difficult for them to stand up and go, oh, you know what, we're so sorry. For the last 25 years, we've been – actually, in this case, since 1980, and we're now looking at 35 years, 33 years – We've been telling you stuff that killed hundreds of thousands of you. Like, gee, sorry about that. Could you elect us next time? Like, it's they're never going to like do that. So, what's been going on since then? 1984. Let's put 1.3 million dollars into this inner salt study. There, they looked at 10,000 people, and they found that societies with higher sodium had higher average blood pressure. The problem was they were looking at some very unusual, like paleo societies that lived in the middle of the jungle. And they threw out some other data. What the data actually showed when, when we re-crunch the data in a more modern time is they found that blood pressure drops as salt intake goes up. Like everyone should hear that again. Your blood pressure goes down as you eat more salt. That's what, it, that's what happens for most people except a few edge cases. They found that the group they studied in Chicago that had the lowest salt intake had the most hypertension – and in China, the group that had the highest salt intake had almost no hypertension. So the first study they say proved salt is bad actually proved that salt is good. So what they did when they found this, they said, let's find some other questions we can ask of this data, which is something you're not supposed to do. So they started talking about, is higher salt correlated to a faster rise in blood pressure with age and some other questions like that? In 99, this is getting to be like the time when you and I were alive. The NHANES follow-up study comes around. The group with the most salt had a lot more strokes and death from strokes and heart attacks and 39% higher mortality. We've proven salt is bad, right? Except the data really showed that the only time the risks were higher was when you were studying obese subjects. If you're not highly overweight, salt is not harmful. There is no correlation of sodium and heart disease in people who are not obese. So it's obesity combined with a high salt intake is the problem. We think if you look at the data from that study, I mean, it sounds really impressive. You know, we're talking tracking 21,729 people. Slight problem. Here's how they did it. So um, could you tell me how much salt you had in the last 24 hours? Like that's the survey question. So like, I don't know. Can you tell me how much salt you had in the last 24 hours, Evan? I would say a moderate amount. <laughs> I know, but I need like grams for my survey here. I got 21,729 people to ask this of. Oh, okay. Uh, four grams. There you go. Thanks. Let me write that down. All right, next. That is the data we're using. Recall surveys are stupid. Like you, you cannot do nutritional epidemiology based on recall like that with any degree of certainty. So this guy who is a personal hero of mine, although I haven't met him, um, his name is Michael Alderman. He's a really well-respected epidemiologist, the former president of the American Society of Hypertension. So – Here's a direct quote from what he said when he looked at the NHANES data. You ready? The more salt you eat, the less likely you are to die. End of quote. Okay? Here's how he knows this. He not only looked at the data, but he said, what's the impact of salt on your health, your quality of life, and on your length of life? And then he studied people who had only a little bit of hypertension. And instead of asking them how much salt they had, he measured their urine in 3,000 people, which is a huge number of people. So he could see how much sodium came out because amazingly, your body excretes sodium when you eat it. So you now know with absolute quantitative certainty how much salt these people had. And he followed them for four years. People with the lowest sodium had the most heart attacks and the most other cardiovascular complications. Wow. So I guess the all these meals that people may have been eating for the last 20 years, lean cuisine and all these different silly 40% less sodium and all that stuff – is there long-term damage from a lack of sodium? Absolutely. Here's what low sodium is proven to do in studies published in the JAMA Journal, the Journal of the American Medical Association. I am not exactly a huge fan of JAMA because I, I think they have some conflicts of interest uh, quite often actually. But if they're willing to publish it, it usually passes at least some muster. So low sodium increases renin, which is a hormone in the blood, and – Renin raises your blood pressure. So you cut sodium, you raise renin. If you have a 2% rise in renin, you have 25% more heart attacks. So you eat more salt to keep renin low. The other problem is that when you're on low sodium, it increases your aldosterone and it increases, get this, your LDL cholesterol. 
holy crap, maybe you should eat some more salt. It also raises insulin resistance. What I thought the whole point of going paleo or eating the Bulletproof diet was to not raise insulin resistance. Low salt diets also reduce sexual activity in men. People don't know this, but you know where graham crackers, which are low salt, and raisin bran, which is low salt, you know where those came from? Like why they were created? They were created by Kellogg and one other guy in his generation to reduce libido in men. That's ridiculous. I'm serious because, hey, we're moralistic. You know, we're, we're good people. If we could just calm down these sexual urges, society would be so much better. So let's feed people this low-salt, fibrous stuff that makes you weak. That's what people think is breakfast. And even worse, that's what they give to their kids. It's not okay. The other thing low-salt does is it's proven to cause cognitive difficulties and anorexia in older people. And worst of all, things without salt in them taste like crap. So you should eat salt. That's what all this comes down to. <laughs> That's incredible, man. It's sad to say that it's actually a conspiracy and the food industry has been against you your whole life. I mean that's probably hard for a lot of people to digest. It's not a conspiracy. That That is something that's pretty important to understand. When In my career, I'm fortunate. I, I helped to create um, one of the very first modern cloud computing environments. When you have like hundreds of thousands of servers and – you know all these connections and all this stuff moving around. You realize the system is so complex, you cannot measure the state of, of the entire system at one time. So you end up thinking about things where many, many variables change at the same time. And what you get is something called emergent behaviors. And what we have in the food industry isn't you know a group of you know evil guys, you know old men in suits meeting behind closed doors to figure out how to give cancer to the world. What you have is hundreds of thousands of well-meaning people who work in the food business. And they make billions and billions of small decisions on a daily basis that end up with an emergent behavior that says, let's make the most money from food that we can. And when you do that, it turns out we'll sell food that causes cravings because people will buy more food. You don't do that on purpose. You just happen to do that because you're maximizing for profit at the end of the day. I have no problem with maximizing for profit. But if you do it without awareness, you're doing problems. Or so you're doing problems, you're causing problems. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. So I guess it's just part of the massive size that some of these companies are that it's hard to make massive shifts like that too. It It's uh, it's very true. And there's a couple of things we should talk about since we're spending a lot of this on salt. Sure. The There is definitely evidence that too much sodium without enough potassium and in very particular magnesium, you can have problems. So – if you are not taking magnesium, which is on my – it's actually at the top along with vitamin D of my list of most bulletproof supplements, you've got to be on magnesium. Most people, about 800 milligrams a day, not magnesium oxide. So if you're going to be eating any amount of salt, especially the amounts of salt that are healthiest, the higher amounts of salt, you should be taking magnesium with it. And if you eat your vegetables, you're getting enough potassium. Or I highly recommend doing something like um, potassium citrate as a supplement as well. Potassium citrate helps with some detox functions uh, as well, but you probably don't need it if you're younger or you have normal health. Right. Okay. That's awesome, man. I wanted to get into the fact of earth mats and grounding. and I heard you talk about – these are amazing topics to me and basically you talked about the effects of jet lag on your body and that you can actually reduce them by using what's called an earth mat. So tell everybody what that is. Sure. So earthing is something that sounds uh, actually very hippie. I was concerned about talking about this on the Bulletproof Executive site because um, I wasn't always as as popular um, or it wasn't always as popular uh, as it is now. And you don't want to, you know, just go out there and just be too wild and crazy. But I also believe that this effect is so strong and so measurable that I would be doing a disservice if I didn't talk about it and just have the integrity to say what my own data shows uh, so that we can have an open conversation about it. Um, the feedback from my executive consulting clients and the people I've worked with on, on earthing is, is profound and very predictable. So th- this stuff is real and it works. What you do is, as you walk around every day wearing shoes, you're insulated electrically from the earth. And it turns out our bodies are electrical machines. I mean, they, they have a lot of chemical things they do. There's hormones and whatnot. But at the same time, there's a flow of electrons in the body. It controls things like pH, acidity, things like that. So when you walk around all day, 
air goes over your skin and you build up a static charge. You probably felt static electricity a few times, but you build it up even if you don't have you know, sparks coming off your fingers. And then you go to sleep and you're in a house with carpet that's insulated from the ground. And over time, you build up a charge and it affects your ability to heal quickly. It also affects your circadian rhythm and the quality of your sleep. So I, I discovered, oh, maybe 2006, 2007, I used to fly every six weeks from San Francisco Bay Area to to Heathrow, to London. I worked as a senior executive at a company based in Cambridge. So it was a hell of a commute. When you commute in that direction, the jet lag just kills you. So I was really actively hacking my jet lag. I would try sunglasses. I tried eating at different times. I tried exercising to raise my body temperature, drinking cold water, like all this biohacking stuff that made everyone on the airplane think I was probably only half a terrorist. What, one time when I got there, like the one time ever in England where there was actually sunshine, I went to the park and I did yoga in the park after I landed to try and raise my body temperature. And I had no jet lag that trip. I was, it was like a weight was gone from my neck. I'm like, oh. And the next time I did it, it was raining. So I did yoga in my hotel room and I had jet lag. And I was so bummed. And it took like a couple of years and reading another couple um, – uh, actually reading a book by this guy who had um, done more research on it. His name's Ober. And uh, lo and behold, there is a difference of doing yoga in the park. I was doing it without a mat, so I was grounding myself. If you stand barefoot for 20 minutes a day in semi-moist soil or grass, you dump the electrical charge that your body builds up. But what I do is I have a mat that goes, or a half sheet or a little mat that goes on my bed and it's plugged into the round part of the electrical outlet on my wall. That's a a grounded system. You lay on this mat. There's no active components in it. It's just conductive fiber made out of silver. And as you sleep, the, uh, the excess charge in your body grounds out against the earth and you wake up with less muscle soreness and better sleep. I quantified an improvement in sleep quality. You get more deep sleep that way. And like Lance Armstrong used this along with a few other more interesting substances um, during his Tour de France wins because it speeds recovery. So I, I got to hand it to anyone who's willing to find every single little performance enhancing technique there is. Um, so yeah, Lance Armstrong used this as one of his performance enhancing techniques. I tested it. The difference is so big that half the people who get one of these things um, they're about like 70 bucks. I have them on Upgraded Self. You can buy them also on other places. But if you like this podcast, I appreciate your support. Um, UpgradedSelf.com. But I don't manufacture those. I just carry them because a lot of my uh, my clients like them. So my clients, a typical phone call goes like this. I have a coaching session. And they say, you want me to buy what? And I say, look, just try it. Like You're willing to listen to what I have to say here. So just sleep on the mat or use it for a little while and tell me what you do. And then they call me up on the next coaching session a week later. And they said, well, I, I couldn't really sleep with it. And I said, why not? And they said, well, it tingled. I said, yeah, that's circulation returning to some parts of your body that didn't have circulation. A lot of them can only tolerate a half hour or an hour of laying on a mat that's grounded. There's no electricity flowing whatsoever through this mat except coming off their bodies. And then after most of them, after they do it for three or four nights, they just don't want to sleep without it because it improves the quality of their wake up so much. So I don't sleep ungrounded. Uh, even when I'm flying in Asia and the electrical system is different, I ground myself to the cable system because I only sleep like sometimes three or five hours a night on a business trip. And I'm on stage sometimes for 10 hours straight for my, my day job in computer security, you know, giving keynote presentations, talking to customers. Um, you know, I'm 18 time zones away from where I live and you know, barely have time to eat. On that kind of just physically and psychologically grueling sort of day, like I'll be damned if I'm not going to get the most sleep I can get. And the way I do that is earthing along with some other trip tricks on sleep hacking that I write about. Wow. So grounding yourself is something I need to get into more because I work outside, but I'm still wearing boots. I guess grounding your entire body is more important. So is that important for anyone working out? And if you're exercising, are you going to notice faster recovery time? Uh, I do. Wow. That's, I mean, pro athletes do. The guy who did this for Lance Armstrong is the team's physician. Uh, There's a a relatively well known cardiologist named Stephen Sinatra. I mean, if you're a licensed cardiologist, like as soon as you come, as soon as you get too too out there, they start sniffing around trying to take your license. So this guy, he's definitely a bit of a maverick anyway, but he flat out like came out and said, look, this is one of the most important health discoveries I've come across in my career. Look how this, look at the data, like this works. Uh, so uh, kudos to Steven Sinatra for, for having the balls to do that. 
in his position of authority. So it's real. Like, I just have, I have no question about it. When people, I heard a tweet the other day, I no longer believe in Dave Asprey because he advocates earthing mats. And I'm like, hey, don't believe in me. I'm just a dude. Like, I don't need you to believe in me. <laughs> but B, like, okay, then don't sleep earthed. But it makes a difference. That's incredible, man. So why is this not more popular? How long is it going to take for earthing mats to be mainstream? Because the, the, the distance between an earthing mat and a tinfoil hat is too narrow. Yeah. Sorry. Um, it's, it just sounds too crazy. And if you believe that, what else do you not know? It scares people. But it's, it's, like, it's a simple thing. It's perfectly natural. We were designed like all animals to walk around on the planet. And that's how our body drops the charge. So, okay, <laughs> accept it and move on. Right. Yeah, Dave, that's why I'm glad I was able to find you because someone to be along this path because it's hard to really convince a lot of people. And I think we still got a lot of work to do. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a lifetime worth of work, to be perfectly honest. But, you know, the, the other day, this, this guy came up to me. At a, I was speaking to a, a room full of CEOs about human performance. And he said, I want to shake your hand. I said, all right. And, and the guy was pretty heavy, about 400 pounds. And he said, I, uh, I want to show you something. He pulls his waistband out. And he's like, his pants are four sizes too big. And he says, I read your blog six weeks ago, and I've lost like 45 pounds. Uh, and he says, I want to shake your hand and say thanks. But um, here's a card from my wife. You know, She couldn't be here tonight. And the card basically said, Thank you for giving me my husband back. Not losing weight, but because his brain turned on in a way I haven't seen in 20 years, in six weeks. So if I can do that for even only a few people and their whole life is changed and upgraded for years and years and years, I, I win. Like that is, that is the most amazing, impactful thing that I can do. And I wish to hell someone had done that for me when I was 16 instead of letting me be obese and uncomfortable and in a state of brain fog for – a very long period of time. I wanted to see if it'd be all right with you if I, I asked your viewers for, for help in two areas. Well, one of them, we just launched the Better Baby Book, which is a description of how you use all these bulletproof techniques to have kids that are healthier and smarter with better genes that they pass on to their kids. Um, it's It took five years and, and tens of thousands of dollars of research to put the book together. It was published by Wiley uh, at the end of last year without any announcements whatsoever because Wiley put it on the market six weeks early. We are relaunching the book uh, the week of February 25th. We're hoping to sell enough copies in order to get onto one of the bestseller lists. So we need to sell a lot of copies that week. So if you uh, are listening to this and you go out and you purchase 25 copies of the book on Amazon, which sounds like a lot of money, uh, it's about 11 bucks a copy, um, we will give you coaching sessions worth about that amount of money. So basically you get the books for free. If you're interested in getting you know, a half hour or an hour of time with me or with my wife who's a physician who does coaching on fertility, please help us support making this book famous by getting it on a bestseller list. So February 25th to whatever seven days plus that is, is the period that the bestseller lists are measuring. And that's where we're sort of hanging our hat. So if you wanted to get some time one-on-one, -on -one, that's the way to do it. Buy our book. We will make maybe $6 off that, but you'll get our time and our eternal gratitude. Well, that's cool, man. That sounds great. I think I should put a link up on the site for that. Please do. Put your affiliate code in there too. There's no sense you're not getting the affiliate code. I, you know, As the author, I make a very small amount per book, but right. the, uh, the important thing here is I'm, we just need the sales numbers for people to, to show that – you know, the world's paying attention to the book so we can get it in the hands of more parents so we can have healthier kids in the next generation. Like something I want to get into in the future is an acupressure mat and either promote or be a part of an acupressure mat promotion because it's, it's changed my life as much as probably the earthing mats have changed your life. Oh, I've been sleeping on an acupressure mat for a while. Those things are really cool. That's awesome. Are you doing a full body one for your head and your, your torso or you do legs or – I just do uh, from my butt to my, to the back of my neck. That's cool. Yeah, that's what I have. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty amazing. We'll have to get into those on another another podcast one of these days. But I got to run. All right, thanks, Evan. Hey, appreciate it, man. 
Well, thanks again for Dave for coming on the show. He had to go to another meeting, so we had to end it a little bit abruptly. But I hope you got some good information from this show, and we're definitely going to get him on again in the future. But in the meantime, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at evan at notjustpaleo, E-V-A-N, at notjustpaleo.com. You can reach me there. You can reach me on my Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash notjustpaleo. Also on Twitter, same thing, notjustpaleo. Some of these topics can be very overwhelming if you're new to them. So just take your time and, like I said, do research into all this stuff. And you can head back over to Dave's site. He's got a bunch of articles and research there that you can learn more about these different topics like mycotoxins. So I got a few links back up on the site. You can go to notjustpaleo.com forward slash podcast 16 podcast one six you go there and you'll be able to find all the different things in the books that he has so you could definitely go check those out and i just like to say that this was awesome and if you listen to this whole thing then that was that was the goal so if you have any guests that you'd like to have on and people that you want me to interview definitely send me an email i'd love to hear any suggestions or people that you may be interested in some hidden gems in the health industry i know they're out there And I hope that you share this episode and share not just Paleo with your friends and family. That's really the goal of this. I'll be down at Paleo FX in Austin, Texas next month. So looking forward to that. There's going to be basically everyone that is in the health and fitness world. We're going to be talking together. There's going to be a bunch of different speeches. Jimmy Moore, who you heard on a past episode, he'll be on there. Abel James from Fat Burning Man, he'll be on that episode. There's a lot of people that I've had on this podcast that we're going to be hanging out down there at Paleo FX. So tickets are still available to that. I think you can go to the real paleofx.com or search for Paleo FX 2013 and you can buy a ticket. It's about 280 bucks plus your airfare, travel expenses, all that good stuff. But if you're so interested and you're so dedicated to educating people or just changing your personal health, then it's definitely something to look into. So maybe we'll see you down there. Feel free to come d- come down and hang out and introduce yourself. So we'll see you then and uh, look forward to the next episode. Thanks again. She doesn't have a clue that he's terrible clues. Why I'm in a tire got to watch out, girl. Don't want to see her by her eyes out, girl. Because I've been watching, you've been hurting. Let me be the one that 